Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to start by saying I don't belong to any alumni of any business school, so I'm really delighted that I'm an integral part of Imbue, the first ever event of an IIM in terms of really holding this leadership summit. So thank you so much, Saif, Hairish, and the team for you know, giving me this uh, opportunity to really uh, work with all of you to put this together. IMBU is really a le about leadership, and it is about leadership that makes a difference to society. Leaders have made a difference and steered their societies or organizations to new horizons. And all these such leaders have hardly conformed. Spurred by the courage of conviction, they exhibit the willingness to confront all odds. They are entrepreneurial risk takers and innovators, mavericks and pioneers, visionaries and game changers. Ladies and gentlemen, we have amongst us today a distinguished game changer, the most talked about Bazigar, who will weave magic through his Paheli this evening. It is indeed a proud privilege to welcome the King of Bollywood, the global ambassador of Indian cinema, Dilwale Shah Rukh Khan. He is an entertainer by profession who won the hearts of millions of people the world over through his extensive body of work and abundant charisma. A multifaceted personality, he acts, sings, dances, presents television and stage shows and is also a world-class entrepreneur, winner of numerous awards and accolades. He is a true leader and one of the world's biggest movie stars. Let's give a big round of applause to our Batsha of Bollywood, Shah Rukh Khan. So you can see that we have here with us the one and only Shah Rukh Khan. Shah Rukh, of course, has found a place in billions of hearts, not only with his work in cinema, but he has also made an indelible mark with his entrepreneurial genius marketing innovation and his Dilse communication, which connects him with people across all strata. I just want to spend a few minutes saying how much I appreciate Shah Rukh and the wonderful human being he is. I first met Shah Rukh in 2005 when we both received our Padma Awards from the late Abdul Kalamji. And a year later, I reached out to Shah Rukh and I said, Shah Rukh, do you think you could launch a home-researched cancer drug for me? And I thought he was going to politely decline. But to my utter delight and surprise, he spontaneously agreed. And he actually shared with me the experience he had as a cancer caregiver in terms of his own parents. And he came across as someone who was very compassionate, very caring. And that's when I got to know what Shah Rukh was all about, a wonderful, caring human being. On behalf of IIMB and the alumni, I would like to express our deep gratitude to Shah Rukh for accepting to inaugurate this pioneering event tonight. And I must say, in his true style, when we reached out to him, he very spontaneously agreed to be here with us. So thank you, Shah Rukh. Thank you so much. As you know, IMBU has brought together personalities, philanthropists, business leaders, and policy makers. And through IMBU, we seek to inspire and be inspired, to motivate and to be motivated, to imbue and to be imbued with the spirit of action that can spark and accelerate meaningful change. It's all about engaging, being energized, and enhancing. So I just want to 
welcome Shah Rukh once again. Thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving Shah Rukh a resounding round of applause. And now, may I ask Shah Rukh to please inaugurate Imbue 2015. Kiran, I only like her because I can say I love you, Kaka Kaka ka, Kiran to her. That's how I do that. She's the only one. I, I don't know any other Kiran. So thank you. Tu hai meri Kiran. I can do the whole song for her. But uh, first of all, I see some friends here. Good evening, Shashi Saab, Vijay Saab, Kabir Ji is here, Koshik Sir is here, everyone. Thank you very much for having me over. Thank you, Seth, for putting all this together. And uh, I've heard, uh, of course, the alumni is here, and uh, the faculty is here, some students are here, and all the distinguished guests. Thank you for having me over. <clears throat> so I was extremely pleased with myself when Kiran told me that I have to come and give, give the keynote lecture for this alumni conclave until I saw the alumni list and my mind suddenly froze up, like the icebergs that I've been shooting in Iceland for my next film. <clears throat> because I was thinking, what will I say to these wonderfully wise people? For a second, I even contemplated sending a stunt double. <laughs> but then I read a joke about the wisdom of all of you amazing achievers from IM. The joke made it clear to me that all of you are extremely wise, but your wisdom is of a different kind from us lesser mortals. It, it went something like this, so I'll tell you the joke. So if it's wrong and politically incorrect, please ban me. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So it was about a kid who claimed he was too good for the standard first or class one that he was in and should be promoted to the fourth standard. Seems all IM guys feel like that about themselves. <laughs> so he was marched to the principal's office and for Gender equality reasons, even in jokes, the principal happened to be a lady. So she <coughs> thought the kid should be given a fair chance, as ladies are always fair, and said she would ask him a few questions. And if he answers them right, he will be promoted to the fourth standard, as he wished. Her first question to him was, what does a cow have four of, and I have only two of? And the boy, after a moment, said, legs. What's in your pants that you have? but I do not have. The boy said, pockets. What does a lady do sitting down? A man does standing up, a dog does with his one leg raised, she asked. The boy said, shake hands. <laughs> the final one was what starts with F and ends with K, obviously, and is a four-letter word, and if you don't get it, you have to use your hand, and the boy confidently said, a fork. <laughs> so the principal looks at the teacher and tells him, don't send him to the fourth standard. Send him to the IM. He'll be a perfect fit there. <laughs> so that gave me some confidence to stand before you all. Maybe in your quest for knowledge, you all might have overlooked some very basic and simple truths. So here I am, <laughs> not to tell you those answers, but just kind of widen your horizons about what the answers could have been. <laughs> so I want to clarify right at the beginning, I am no guru in creative leadership. Please bear me with some compassion, patience, and do excuse my humor. Kiran, you especially. I mean, I don't want you to be embarrassed that you called me here, okay? <laughs> okay, so here goes. The essence of creativity is the ability to channelize imagination into expression and build from it something new and possibly ingenious. Whether it is an art form or a scientific invention or discovering a new way of doing the same old thing. It begins in the mind. A mind that does not function within the framework of boundaries, but constantly searches beyond, searches beyond those boundaries, is a mind that is able to create anew. 
The cornerstone of leadership, I believe, is nothing more than cultivating the discipline and courage to nurture and sustain such a mind while constantly calling the bluff of the illusory limits imposed by life. See, I am 50. I don't look it, but I am. Right? <laughs> An age where you most likely are making retirement plans, not romantic plans. But here I am, still coochie queen, with girls my children's age. And they don't look up to me at all. Uh, one of the reasons is they're all taller than me, so they don't look up to me. But, <laughs> but they kind of think of me as equal and their age. And that's because, having been put in the position of someone who's a romantic hero, so to say, I've cultivated a belief that I can love them back as beautifully as any man can, age notwithstanding. With respect, dignity, and also to put my own experiences of life, which younger guys don't have, of course. <laughs> Though I must admit, girls have a bit of a father fixation, and that comes in handy with my endeavors. <laughs> Leaders are able to assimilate experience in order to reframe the world around themselves on their own terms. They use the very structure of life to dismantle it. They're not afraid to question, to imagine, to dream, and most importantly, to believe. They're also not afraid to act, even if their actions might not result in success. There is an old song I always turn to when I'm faced with adversity. Being a public figure, most of my actions and intentions are questioned, reviewed, and sometimes loved, and sometimes even distorted. Ranging from praising my sexiness to questioning my sexuality, I get it all. But whenever I feel thwarted, I think of the song. The song is a very old one, so maybe most of you won't know. Or maybe if the LMNI is really, really old, then you would all know. It's a song called Hum To Mohabbat Karega. I've only changed the words, so I'll sing it for you as badly as I can. Hum to act karega, dunia se nahi darega, chahe ye zamana kahe, hum ko divana kahe, hum to act karega. So please do act, take the action, nothing is more important than that. Many books have been written on leadership skills, on methods and models for it. But in my view, it really isn't all that complicated at all. To be able to dream unencumbered, to imagine and hang on to a boundless mind filled with ideas, so that you never stop renewing yourself and the world around you, whether it is your inner world, your consciousness, or your outer world, that encompasses your profession and your relationships is essential to leadership. But dreaming is not enough. It's also important to be able to dismantle the old, the frameworks that are laid out before you, the ideas that you yourself cling to, the ones that hold you back and prevent you from growing. It is by disassembling your fears of failing, of losing, not just things but people and even positions and jobs, and most of all, change that you can be truly creative, not just in the things you choose to do, but in the way you view your part in the world you inhabit. I meet many successful people in the world of business, and I often find that while their ideas are very, very clear, the way they speak of them is oddly dispassionate. The madness and passion are missing. I get the sad impression that business often becomes numerical, about millions and targets, or it ends up being so goal-driven that there is a stark loss of inspiration from it. I think the emphasis on organizational goals and efficiency has clouded the poetry of creating. Perhaps because of the artistic basis of the work I do, it is difficult for me to relate to this darkness. I feel it lacks life. I may be completely wrong. Creation cannot be a managerial concept or a notion. No matter how good the idea is, it has to be an imaginarial conception. You have to imagine things. To lead means to inspire, to imagine, and you cannot inspire people mechanically or through numericals. Yeah, okay, with all due respect, unless they are stockbrokers or bankers. Inspiration is an emotional construct. To make people believe in anything, whether it is a product, a story, an idea, or you yourself, you need to connect their ability to imagine and dream with your own. You cannot create within a box with unbending walls. It is an open process, one that is welcoming and even wild at times. To abandon that inclusive wildness for a narrow defined goal is, is illusory. I have never set one, 
goals, that is. I have never set out to earn a particular amount, to count the crores at the box office, or to compare my worth with anyone else's. In fact, I would go as far as saying that quantifiable goals are indeed illusions. The only reality actually is hard work. Diligence is imperative to both creativity and leadership. Making the mistake of thinking that your dreams will take flight without you having to flap madly at those wings to get up into the sky is plain silly. In my experience, it's great to delegate, but there's no shortcut to working hard. To know and to understand what you're doing, to be open to learning about it and from it, every single moment requires diligence. It requires work. If you want to excel at something, there shouldn't be a single person around you who can claim to be more familiar with this mechanics than you are. It's non-negotiable to strive and to be familiar with your own trade, with your own work. Life remains ordinary if you are unable to sustain the capacity to work hard on your dreams. If you aren't determined to get there, you won't. And this is a paradoxical thing, because I've heard many people say that you need to know where you're going to be determined about reaching there. But it hasn't been the case with me. I never knew my destination. I can't even claim to know it today. Now that I'm on the cover of Forbes India, is that where I wanted to be as a businessman? My IPL team has won the championship and is profitable. Is that the dream I had for a sporting franchise venture? I have a film running in a cinema hall for the last 20 years. Should that be the attempt in terms of achievement for my next film? No, I don't think so. I believe goals actually limit our ambitions and desire. I don't mean that don't have goals, but call them mere milestones. Think of them as a passing moment of excellence and keep on striving harder for a place which cannot be defined or confined by names or numbers. I have never set goals, but I have truly never done a single thing that I wasn't determined to do the best at. I had no idea where it would take me for the most part of it, but I had the idea that I would do whatever it was with the determination that would scare everyone else away. And no matter how hard we work, however, leadership implies being prepared for disaster also. And it will come. If it doesn't hit you like a tsunami washing away your houses and homes, like unfortunately it happened in Chennai, it'll show up some other way, as failure maybe. Or then, by taking away something or someone you loved and believed in. So what are you going to do about it? You can cry and wallow. I do that often, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. Though I do it in a special corner reserved for tears in my huge golden bathroom. Yeah, somewhere between the jacuzzi and the steam room. I sit on the floor and shed huge tears of self-pity, persecution, and how the world doesn't understand my genius and effort. But I take a hot and cold shower, that helps, and walk out wearing my limited edition cologne, ready to embrace disaster. So a bit of wallowing and crying is okay. But the thing to understand is that if you learn how to welcome disaster, you will and you can overcome it. So what if, if everything gets turned on its head? Change your perspective. Do a handstand. Don't sit there staring at the ruins. Start getting bits of you together and rebuilding yourself. That's what leadership is about, after all. Besides, a perfect life, according to me, is a farce. God isn't making utopian ad films and screening them on the clouds to sell its USP to you. There is no perfect life. It's a man-made idea, and we are buying into it all the time. Actually, there is nothing more beautiful than the imperfections of life. Creativity is about taking the imperfection and translating it into something beauteous. In my trade, life serves as a fertile ground for innovation and ideas. We use its imperfections every moment. In fact, there is really nothing that allows us to create better or to live better than trouble. So why not embrace it? And embrace it. Embrace ourselves too while we're embracing it. And while we are embracing, let's embrace destiny too. And while we're embracing, in my case, I will embrace Kajol, Madhuri, and Alia also. Which unfortunately doesn't come in your perks packages, guys. Whichever company you join or create, so ha ha. 
Because actually, destiny isn't what it's rolled out to be either. Accidents happen. I'm a living proof of an accident movie star slash entrepreneur slash speaker at an IAM gathering. I wanted to be a sportsman. Represent India hopefully as a hockey or a cricket player or an athlete. Suddenly I hurt my back, didn't have the resources to get the best treatment in the world. Joined a theater group to fill in time and overcome my sadness of not being able to play at a professional level. Father died suddenly and we were evicted from a rented house. Mother went looking for a smaller place and the dealer, the property dealer's father-in-law was making a series called Forging. My mother went to, sent me to him and he cast me as Abhimanyu Rai in the serial. Things went ballistic from there, yeah. <laughs> Things just completely went haywire from there. <clears throat> I got film offers and one thing led to another and I became a movie star. And I just want to tell you, by the way, we never took the house from the dealer. <laughs> so I want to thank him. His name is uh, Dhawan, we used to call him Dhawan Uncle. So Mr. Dhawan, who actually got me on the road to stardom. And uh, yeah, and my mother didn't live long enough to see my work either. I realize now that hurting my back wasn't an accident. Being here, speaking to you all, is the larger, happier accident. So destiny plays a part, for sure, and no one can teach us either how to find it or how to chase it. Just like disaster, it will come your way. But if you don't have the courage to ride its waves when it does, it will toss you right back on the beach and all you'll get to see is the sunset of a tired and a weary life, plus a very, very sore backside. So I would advise keeping your eyes open for life's magic and not turning away from its citing practicality and good reason. There isn't one. Be brave enough to face your destiny, to sacrifice for it, and compromise for it if you have to. It will always be worth it. To imagine that you know better than life is the silliest and possibly the most costly mistake one can ever make. So to conclude, I'd like to borrow from my latest endeavor of creativity, Dilwale. I have to market that too. <laughs> so the movie says that unless you live by the heart, unless you are Dilwale, none of this will truly translate into the splendor that life is capable of unfolding before you. The mind is the seed of creativity, but the heart is the soil. That seed cannot grow without an open heart. To be able to love, to give, to share, to nurture, to take others along on your journey with as much goodwill for them as you have for yourself is the basis of all creative endeavor, of all real success, of all happiness, and of true leadership. If you close up your heart to the world, if you choose to live your life on parameters that let you forget how to love, you will dishonor life and disallow it from honoring you. There is no greater creativity in life or leadership than the ability to touch each moment that you're living with the beauty of living it by your heart. To give back to life the fullness that it has had the generosity to give you. And the joke that I cracked about the little kid giving all abnormal answers to basic questions was just a joke. I don't think you guys are like that. <laughs> I mean, I really think all of you from I am a very sexy and very, very cool. Actually, I must admit, it's really, really next to impossible to find such a combination of smart and sexy in so many people together. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, I'm not lying. It's been an honor to be amidst you and talk to you, for it does get lonely just talking to myself in the corner of my golden bathroom. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.